This is fun. This is cool. Um, he's lying. If you think he's not nervous to be with a black woman and a Hispanic woman <laughs> who can... I really thank you for that icebreaker, Ann. Uh, no, it is a, a total pleasure uh, to represent the enemies of the American people to you. Uh, and, and to be with such badass wise women of cable news, Anna Navarro, obviously, from CNN. And Joy Reid, MSNBC host, and I have to say a Daily Beast columnist, which I love. <laughs> I've been trying to get Anna to write for the Beast for a long time, and she always has a great response. Yeah, I tell him, look, I, I can't commit to writing every week. For me, writing is like sex. If I'm not in the mood, I don't want to do it. <laughs> there is nothing an editor can say to that, by the way. It's like, okay, um, you're, it's all you, whatever. <laughs> Um, but we got a lot to talk about, uh, and uh, we're going to have a lively, fun conversation. But let, let's start it on, on this level. Um, obviously, this is an intense time to be in the news. Our sense of mission is clear. There's a lot of incoming. But there are also folks who say, and you, know, you represent sort of the journalism and opinion side of cable news, uh, that cable news is making it worse. It's contributing to the din. It's deepening our divides. What do you say to that, Joy? I mean, in a sense, I guess it is. First of all, thank you um, all for having me here. It's great to be here, great to be with you guys. Um, sure, I think that you know every aspect of communication now deepens the divide because people can sort of choose your own adventure. <laughs> if you only want to hear conservative thought and opinion, you can just watch Fox, just read Breitbart. You can lock yourself in that bubble if you only want to hear well, I mean, it's a little bit different on, on the other side, I would have to say, because at CNN, they try to have both sides clashing, and MSNBC has its you know, contingent of, of conservatives. But um, I think that you can choose to lock yourself in if you want to. Um, and people are so polarized that people are often doing that. But I will say that in this particular time, I kind of exempt that a little bit, because Trump is such a sui generis mm. kind of thing. And I think that the unique threat <laughs> Um, honestly, to, to our norms, yeah. it's so unique that I think at this point, the intensity is kind of okay. Right, Anna, because you, you try to transcend a lot of the, the typical divisions that people used to assume would come from. You're a Republican commentator who has no problem criticizing the president. Um, that's because that's he's not a Republican. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was a Republican when he was a Democrat. I was a Republican when he was an Independent. I was a Republican when he had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I absolutely think the media has a responsibility. Uh, I think that uh, we have deepened the divide. I think that, um, that provoking confrontation has become a thing. We know that. Uh, but I also think that people have individual responsibility. You choose what you watch. The media is not a nonprofit organization. They are for profit. And so you choose with your wallet. You choose with your eyeballs. Yep. And if you don't want to watch the sexual harasser on Fox News, then don't turn it off. If you don't want to watch the guy spreading fake news about Seth Rich, the DNC staffer on Fox News, don't watch. If you don't want to watch Megyn Kelly interviewing a nutcase, turn the TV off. And so I say to viewers, you've got personal responsibility. And the other thing I will tell you, though, in defense of the media, We've seen terrible things happen. There's fake news. But I think there's also some of the best news happening right now because the media knows it's under attack. And we are seeing true journalists remember who they are and what they are, stick to facts. This chumminess that used to exist with the White House has disappeared. And it is all about transparency, facts, pushing the right narratives, not being distracted, people like Maggie Haberman, Jake Tapper, April Ryan, Katie Turr. I mean, there are stars that have come out of this because they've recommitted their, their resolution to be true journalists who are not going to be cowered by somebody who wants the First Amendment curtailed. What she said. Um, so, Joy, let, let's actually extend that because what do you think is the audience's responsibility. We've seen a surge, for example, in people buying news, subscriptions, right? What a right. quaint idea, you're gonna pay for content. <laughs> uh, we've seen a couple of big powerhouses who'd had millions of dollars in sexual harassment suits lodged against them, but once people started protesting and advertisers started pulling out, that fell off. Yeah. So what responsibility do, do viewers and readers have 
for the environment work. I mean, they do have a, a great responsibility. Look, I think we, we are definitely seeing a kind of reignition of civic engagement as a uh -huh. result of Donald Trump. People who took their citizenship, quite frankly, for granted, who didn't think it was that important to vote, who didn't think it was that important to be involved, or have been sort of turned on, you know, sort of like a dormant machine by Donald Trump. And, and just the unique threats that I have to repeat that he does pose to our, our norms. I've never been a person <clears throat> that is believed in this sort of veneration of the voter, right? That the citizen is just this sort of passant recipient um, of whatever it is that the media or politicians are foisting on them and it's yeah. not their fault when they choose. I mean, people have access to more information in this generation than we've ever had in the history of mankind. All the information is available. People are deciding um, that they want to be uh, rocked to sleep by a certain narrative. And I think that there have been you know, there have been people That's like great. Roger Ailes who really innovated the idea that uh -huh. the media's job is not just to give you information. Its job is to reinforce what you feel in your gut and make you feel that you are right and that everyone who disagrees with you is wrong. Um, and he really created that innovation as news, as constituent service, as an extension of politics. And he was very good at it. But you've got a whole generation of Americans who feel they're entitled to have the media tell them that they are right rather than tell them what is happening. Yeah. Right? And tell them that, that yeah. only they are right. So yeah. I put a lot of responsibility on the viewers. You know, but, but we listen, we are partly responsible too. The um, this Washington Post has this really great story, really comprehensive, frightening story about what Russia did um, to interfere in the election, specifically to try to help Donald Trump. And it names a lot of actors who were equally culpable. You did have a media that was eager to disseminate the results of that hack, that was eager to play around in those emails to make that the front page story every day. So the media has some responsibility, but so do people who were eager to consume it. And, and that's a complicated position for us sometimes because in, in, in that election there was a sense, okay, Donald Trump's sucking up all the oxygen with outrageous comments, but you gotta make sure you're being an equal opportunity offender. And so there was a sense that, you know, these, these hacks, there's a degree of news and we've gotta deal with it, we can't ignore it. How, in, in, in rear view mirror, would you have navigated that better? Oh, I would have pummeled Jeb Bush until he started giving interviews. <laughs> you know, look, I, I, a lot of my friends in the Republican primary were very upset with CNN and with every other network because they said all we did was cover Trump. But you see, back in the old days when dinosaurs ruled the earth, uh, <laughs> front runners did not give interviews. They played hard to get, like Catholic girls. Well, Donald Trump, <laughs> was ready to be on at any time, any show, any network. Yes, yeah, sometimes from his bathrobe, because we all know he's got some, uh, you know, calling in from his penthouse, and he was good at it. He was entertaining. He was media savvy. Whereas my friend Jeb Bush was refusing to go on, my friend Marco Rubio was refusing to go on, and Hillary Clinton had the press behind the rope. Mm -hmm. He was giving no access for months and months and months. So, Literally you know, behind a rope. I mean, yeah. This is, yeah, I'm not making any of this up. Yeah. And I mean, I can tell you that I had every person I know in TV news, in every network, calling me and emailing me and begging me, how could they get to Jeb Bush? How could they get to Marco Rubio? And my boys weren't playing. And so, and I met, I remember one time when Donald Trump started running, I was on TV talking about him. This was just after the first few days. And Jeff Zucker, who's the head of CNN, called, uh, emailed me and said, when you're talking about Trump, what's your social media reaction like in, a, in comparison to talking about anybody else? I said, Jeff, I'm not telling you. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm your boss. I said, I said good point. <laughs> um, I said, okay, you want to know something? It's about 300 to 1. And he said to me, which is why you're going to be talking about him for the next nine months. Of course, he lied. It's going to be 49. <laughs> well, maybe hopefully not that long. <laughs> uh, so let, let's actually focus on, uh, on, on both of you guys are really innovative on social media, on Twitter. I mean, you've really built your profiles not only through your journalism and your commentary, which is like one of the best in the business, uh, but your social media presence. Um, how do you consciously deploy that? I mean, is that something that's just natural to you? Like you're just bam, 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 that's, you're extending a conversation? Or is that something you had to learn? Do you know us? I, I do, <laughs> but they don't as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, but you both have deployed social media really effectively. That's not 
native to most journalists, right? Yeah. Some folks preserve that. I mean, we're that from Miami. Right. Yeah. We know how to give shade. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's just what, and, and I, what I love about Twitter, and I am a little bit addicted to Twitter. I, you know, I, I, I kind of understand that sort of impulse in Donald Trump, but I'm not president, right? So, but um, <laughs> Twitter gives you the opportunity to whatever, it, whatever you'd normally be screaming at the TV, you can just scream it into your Twitter feed. Um, and, and so I do kind of, you know, there's a certain amount of filtering. You can't just say whatever's on your mind. Some things you leave in drafts. Right, and right. think about it for a few minutes I do that before a lot. you send yeah. it. Um, but I, I think yeah. social media has actually been really great for being able to open the curtain on what journalists actually think, and being able to disseminate information quickly. You know, I was doing local news back when um, these networks didn't even want to break news on, online, let alone right. social. People were very reluctant to give out anything before the six o'clock news. I think it's a great innovation. Well, look, for me, I, I, um, I really try to use um, some you know, sarcasm, satire, and humor. Because really, folks, this shit is absurd. And so if you don't laugh at it, the, the, to me, it's a coping mechanism. That, alcohol, and internet shopping. <laughs> we, the, there's got to be some laughter here, because if not, we're just going all, we're all going to be like, you know, a Pedro Almodovar film, women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Um, and I, I, too, am like addicted. I have now separation anxiety from, from uh, from being online, from being connected, because I mean, with this guy, you never, you look, you you take a shower for 15 minutes, you might yep. come back, he might have bombed North Korea. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's not true. It's not funny, but it's, it's true. true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you should still laugh. Yeah, but 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 so but there's a flip side to that, right? And it's the question of whether um, Trump semi-strategically is sending out a lot of sort of squirrels, right? The media chases squirrels. We chase Trump tweets, and you ignore executive orders that uh, bring back the ability to have for-profit colleges that defraud their students. You know, you bring back the ability, uh, you know, rolling back real policies that impact people because we're busy chasing the president's tweets. So here's the question. Life is a struggle between the urgent and the important. How do you, as a journalist, as a commentator and analyst, Make sure you're focusing on the important and not just chasing the urgent, yeah. the radioactive. And, you know, and one of the things that I think people, Donald Trump, in, in, a, in a functional sense, is not really president. And what, and what I mean by that, he is providing the entertainment. It is the Republican Party that's making the policies. And the question I think a lot of people need to struggle with is, would those policies be significantly different if Jeb Bush was president? Would they not still be trying to roll back Obamacare? Would Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan be behaving any differently if there was a different president in office? The only difference is they know that they've got a guy in showbiz who can go to Iowa or go to Kentucky and convince his faithful followers that whatever it is that Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell is doing is great even if it's going to take away their health care, destroy their ability to pay for college. It, they don't care, because Donald Trump is literally the entertainment. And so we have to balance, are we covering the entertainment, or are we covering the policy? Well, right. first of all, uh, um, let me say two things. I, I do think things would be different if, a, if Jeb Bush or, or practically any of the other, maybe not Ben Carson, because that's a nice <laughs> uh, But, you know, we're president. I don't think there'd be a Muslim ban. If That's they were the president, That's true. Uh, I don't think very good people would be getting deported and families would be getting That's broken up to the level they are. I don't think we would be out of the Paris Accord. And I could go on and on right. and on with things that I don't think we have a president who lies. You know, I mean, practically right. any of the other Republicans have a fairly consistent record of sticking to facts and information. Maybe not Ted Cruz. Huh? <laughs> Maybe not all. Um, he's Canadian. Um, <laughs> And he claims to be half Hispanic. I still don't know which half. But, um, <laughs> but on the aspect of the, of the executive orders and you know, losing sight, chasing the squirrels, there's only so much bandwidth each of us has, right? So everybody's got to stick to their lane. So I would say to the wonks who care about the whatever it is, you care about it. Honestly, I am obsessed with Russia. Because, folks, that is our democracy, and I want to see a resolution. I want to see the truth come out. To me, that is a bastion of what makes us America. We need to be able to trust our election system, and we need to be able to defend it. And the thought that this geopolitical thug, this foe, has been able to penetrate our election system, influence our elections, because even if he didn't turn one vote, even if he didn't steal one vote, he influenced votes. Mm -hmm. And we cannot measure that, but he did that. 
And that, to me, is unacceptable. You see, I I'm, I'm from the Republican Party who used to uh, hate communist thugs. I don't know who these people are now. So let, let, me, let me press you on that, because it's an important point. You know, one of the, you know, obviously we've got, we've got the Mueller committee, and, and there's no guarantee that Trump doesn't full, fire Mueller, because the independent right. counsel doesn't exist anymore. We've got Republican House and Senate. House seems pretty partisan. Senate's trying to do it right. But what really troubles me is this, that Republican rank and file approval of Vladimir Putin has gone up dramatically. That's right. While the president seems to act like it's not that big a concern. Let's just talk about the base of the party, because that's in some ways more problematic than the president. How do you make sense of that? How well, do you, how do you fix that? How do you, how do you counteract that? You know, there are some things right now that are very difficult to counteract because there's this cult mentality going on where they cannot admit flaw and fault uh, with, with, um, with Trump, frankly. You know, I mean, let's, let's give the guy credit. He is a hell of an effective cult leader. And he has gotten people to hand in their backbones, their conscience, their principles, their common sense. Um, you know, it's... It, it makes no sense. It is incomprehensible. Vladimir Putin is part and pa parcel of the bombings going on of refugees in Aleppo, Syria. People have died because of his participation in that. Vladimir Putin hacked our elections. Va Vladimir Putin sent his, his spooks into the Oval Office and Donald Trump blabbed it, uh, sensitive intel material that was highly classified until he blabbed it out to these two spooks. So I cannot make sense of, of what the hell the Republican Party is uh, thinking about. There are some that do uh, you know, stand up to him and do call him out on that, but frankly, not enough and not consistently enough. And they don't do anything about it. The reality is, is that the, the abrogation of moral authority of the Republican Party has been total. They have traded in, as you said, all of their principles for power. And they've decided, and this is both Repub conservative media and the Republican Party itself, the Republican Party leadership have decided they will do nothing about the greatest incursion into our, into our democratic process in history. This is Watergate on steroids. Watergate was nothing compared to this because it didn't involve a foreign power. But, but people, 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 like, people like Lindsey Graham and but they talk passed a, a sanction, a sanction they did. package. They did, and now, and now you have the White House encouraging House members to essentially water it down, yeah. and if you don't think they'll do it, then you know, we haven't been paying attention to the Republican Party as it is. Unfortunately, we have one party that's decided that Donald Trump is worth it that it's worth it to have total power in Washington, even to look away from what Russia did to our elections. Even the ones who get lots of credit in the media, the Lindsey Grahams and the John McCains, they get credit for words. There have been no deeds. No one is willing to rein this president in because he is a Republican, they are Republicans, and to them that's worth even allowing Vladimir Putin to have power over the United States election. You're absolutely it's, right. Look, they, they're, it's shocking. they're so happy with the appointment of Gorsuch yeah, which I'm happy and about. And the ability too. to overturn health care. And, you know, I mean, you know, McCain and Lindsay are happy that he stood up and, you know, uh, took action on Syria. People are very happy with things like the appointment of Gorsuch and the idea that they can get some Republican agenda items through is making them look the other way yep. on things that, for me, are unacceptable because I'm an American before I'm a Republican. Yep. Right, <laughs> which is the way we all should be. So. I mean, there have been Republican voices in the Senate, Sass, McCain, Graham, and I think your question is, beyond the sanctions vote, which was significant, 98-2, right. wh where, where's the rubber meek in the road? And, 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 and when are the people in the House going to start standing up, too? But let's just talk for a second about the effectiveness of the Democratic uh, pushback, right? Look, I think too much can be made of special elections that are in red states. That yes. said, in Georgia 6, Donald Trump had a 35% approval rating. And Democrats put in over $23 million into that race. And they still weren't able to pull off a win. Now, again, it was re the system of redistricting was rigged. It was a nine-plus Republican district. But what did Democrats do wrong when they have a lot, incredibly low approval for the president, mm -hmm. but Republicans keep pulling the lever, don't send a message by, by nominating a centrist Democrat? Right. But, you know, there is no unrequited love and desperation, like the desperation of Democrats to get Republicans to become Democrats and vote for Democrats. Re Republicans vote for Republicans. It's what they do. 
They're in the so party for a reason. So you don't believe in swing reason. voters? And the idea that Democrats are literally tearing their hair out and looking for a comprehensive reboot because they couldn't win races in Kansas, South Carolina, Montana, and Georgia, all red states, red districts, you mean to tell me that because you can't win Tom Price and Newt Gingrich's seat, you need to overhaul the entire party? Give me a break. This unrequited desperation to get people to be other than what they are. They are Republicans. There are more Republicans in that district than Democrats. That said, if you are trying to compete in a district, and this was about a D plus seven, D plus eight, this is a, re I mean, Republican, R plus eight. This is a Republican district. Right. So they weren't supposed to be able to win it. The fact they got close is sort of a miracle. And the, and the, when they ran a guy like Ossoff, who essentially was kind of neither fish nor fowl, he didn't run hard against Donald Trump. His campaign wasn't, I'm going to be the guy that reigns in Donald Trump. He was, I'm sort of a kind of acceptable centrist kind of version of a Republican, and you can accept me and I'm not so bad. Well, if I have a choice between Republican light and actual Republican, I'm going to pick Republican if I'm a Republican. Right, so, so, so Democrats need to calm down, mm -hmm. stop panicking all the time and start thinking about the 72 districts that are more Democratic-leaning than the one in Georgia. Right. And go after your base. Look, Republicans are good at one thing. Republicans only do base politics. They don't do persuasion politics. You don't see Republicans sitting around whining about why they can't get Democrats to vote for them. They look at their base, they figure out who they are, what they want, what will scare them, what will excite them, and they just do that. Democrats are chasing Republicans rather than getting Democrats to the polls. All right, so let me, let me press you on that. Because it raises the point that there's not a Democratic consensus, it seems to me, on why Hillary Clinton lost and what the right response is, right? Is it that she didn't reach out enough to, quote unquote, white working class voters in the upper Midwest who are more culturally conservative? Uh, was she not left enough with Bernie Sanders to really inspire turnout? Those are two diametrically opposite exactly. visions of the Democratic Party. Uh, so it sounds like your prescription is go left, play to the base, don't worry about the center, or am I misunderstanding you? No, I'm saying don't, uh, don't believe that you can win a Republican district, right, by doing something other than creating more Democrats, meaning voter registration would get you people who are off the board entirely who might be persuadable to the Democratic cause. Chasing and begging Republicans to switch their votes to become Democrats is a fool's errand, and Democrats are obsessed with it. They keep thinking they can go into Republican districts and get someone who's been voting Republican all their lives, except maybe the feel-good 08 vote for Obama, to become Democrats. That is not possible. Look, if, Dem if Hillary Clinton's campaign had gotten 50,000 more black votes in Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee, she'd be president. Yep. Why don't they go after their base, get their base registered, deal with voter suppression and make sure that they can vote and win elections the old-fashioned way with your base. All right, so Anna, what, what Joy's prescribing is basically the mirror image of the play to base vision of, that the Republican Party's been laboring on. Which has been pretty successful. Oh, well, I mean, they haven't, well, they've won one pop, they won the popular vote once in this millennia, uh, so in a presidential. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question for you is, is that, if you're trying to save the Republican Party that you know, if you're trying to redeem the Republican Party that you believed in, that you joined, um, assuming you think that's a winnable mission, uh, what's the right way to do it? I is it trying to build out beyond the base, or is it trying to create a kind of conversion experience for folks who think that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin may not be so bad? <laughs> Look, my, uh, my uh, in immediate strategy, I guess, is just to shame them to death. <laughs> do it do it from within from from within the tent you know remind them of who we are and who we were and what traditional republican values are and keep doing it over and over and over again but i think you know i i never underestimate democrats ability to nominate people who can't get elected <laughs> uh you know this this um guy in georgia i mean he looked like i could have breastfed him <laughs> You know, it, it's, it, and it's over and Millennial over Millennial shaming. Wow. But, look, and there's, there's something, I think, like 24 districts where Hillary Clinton won that are held by Republicans, including yeah. the one I live in. And it's right now represented by a Republican who's retiring, Eliana ross Layton, who's pro-gay rights, pro-immigration reform, and hates Trump almost as much as I do. And, you know, it's, she is made for that district. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, can they recruit it? Now, I'm seeing on the, the, the good news is that I'm seeing a lot more people who want to run and are expressing an interest of, uh, in running than there were before. Because like Joy said, one of the silver linings of Donald Trump 
and you know, there's only like three, is uh, that he has woken something mm -hmm. in America. And hopefully that wokenness translates into running for office and better candidates. Yep. What's it gonna take for Republicans? I'll tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take them thinking they're going to lose the majority. It's going to take them thinking that they're going to lose the, uh, they're gonna lose elections. When they start, if they start thinking this guy is an albatross around their neck that's gonna cost them their own seat, maybe at that point he becomes herpes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the STD metaphor. So, um, <laughs> Uh, but but let me let me let me let me build that out for a second. Right now, Donald Trump, in five months and change as president, has a 60% disapproval rating. Right? I mean, that's an albatross in any normal circumstance. However, he's got an 83% approval rating among Republicans. Uh, independents uh, sort of hold the balance. So that 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 creates a system of you know we got Stockholm syndrome if you're in Congress yeah. because you got the vast majority of House seats are safe. So you're not afraid about losing a general. You're about afraid about losing a primary. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's going to make that equation, uh, that's going to be hard for them to internalize. So wh well, where's your hope on that? Well, look, uh, I, I don't know what they do if Bob Mueller comes out with a report that may not come out before 2018, because these things take a while, saying that this guy obstructed power, that this guy abused power, that his campaign colluded with Russia. I mean, I, that, that's going to be uh, an a wake up moment that's going to be a you know coming to Jesus moment for the Christian you know p party of uh, that, that I belong to um, so you know that's you're asking me what's you know one of my hopes well one one would be that but I really think it's going to take them having a real fear that they're going to lose elections and you know they're they've been as you've said they've been winning the special elections they've been getting you know, a few of the things that they really care about passed. And, and Trump is very good at this art of the deal thing. Actually, he ain't, he ain't making it up. You know, uh, you think it's a coincidence that he's been inviting little Marco and lying Ted to dinner so often and that he just changed uh, Cuba policy? You think he did that because he's got a horrible concern for the human rights of the people of Cuba? A place he tried, he explored opening up a hotel in during the embargo? No, people. It's the art of the deal. And Republicans, many Republicans have figured out, well, we can, we can also learn the art of dealing with Donald Trump. And, you know, they're getting the things that they want and their pet projects. So he is, I will tell you, he's better at that. I mean, there's, there's not many things he's better at, but he's better at that. Right. Than, uh, than President Barack Obama was. No, he, he knows how to curry favor with people who um, are easy to flip. And Marco Rubio, I think, is the perfect example of that. We've both been covering Marco Rubio for a long time. Uh, you know, in order to get what he wants, Marco Rubio went from saying Donald Trump was dangerous to saying he would be honored to help make him president of the United States, to dining with him and trading Cuba policy for a vote on health care. So the reality is, is that as long as the party itself wants power more than it cares about principle, Donald Trump can do whatever he wants. And to your point, Donald Trump has a 36% approval rating, but the gerrymandering of Congress is such that that whole 36% mm -hmm. is distributed in those House Democratic districts. So they are much more worried that someone even further to the right or more Trumpian than they are will primary them than they are about losing their reelections. They saw the truth of that GA6 race is that Republican voters will vote for a ham sandwich as long as it's got an R after its name. It doesn't matter who you put up. As long as it's a Republican, that Republican will get you know, Republican on the, on the thing about um, you know, Rubio and, and all that, let me just say that he has been very committed to this Cuba issue. It's part and, and parcel. It's in his soul. It's part of his community. In the same way that a Graham or a McCain have been uh, screaming, you know, in, into the wilderness for years now about Syria, about foreign policy with North Korea. And Donald Trump is, you know, giving them what, he, what they want. So it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, okay, well, he's bad, but he's not, he, he's got some, they see some redeeming qualities, which until, until they think it cost them an election, they're going to hang on to those you know, it's like when you're with, like, you know, you're married to a guy who can't do this, can't do that, can't do that, but he's good looking. I mean, you hang on to something. <laughs> it's, you know, 
But, well, but, in this case, it's not the good-looking but, part. But, but what are they saying to you in private? I mean, what are they, you know, you're, you're friends with a lot of very influential Republicans. What are they saying to you in private about their faith in the competence of the president? And, and also, what are you saying to them when they're refusing to call them out in public? I'm going to tell you what I say. I'm not going to tell you what they say, because I think private conversations are private, even though the Russians probably already heard. Um, I'm in a blind quote. I, I, I was with Paul Ryan the other day, who I, I love, you know? And, and, and I told Paul, and I, I love his wife even more. I said, and I, I, don't, I, I don't, I cannot bring myself to criticize Paul Ryan, uh, partly because I just adore his wife so much, so he gets a pass because of his wife. And, uh, and I told Paul, you know, look, uh, you're breaking my heart. You are breaking my heart. Uh, I wanted to vote for you for president one day. I thought you were the Republican who could bridge gaps, who talked about compassion, who talked about immigration, who talked about poverty, who went into the inner city, that Jack Kemp Republican of old, and, and your brand is is ruined. Every time I say something remotely mediocre, nice about you, I lose a thousand followers in one hour. You be, you know, you, I mean, and, and I will tell you, um, he knows that. That's all I will tell you. Huh. What, sorry, just exp No, go ahead. He knows he's, <laughs> he's in, he knows that he's, he's in a difficult spot, that he's been a difficult spot. Well, he's not stupid, right? No, he's not. Okay. But, but, you know, but I think it is important to, and, and, I, and I know Paul Ryan is a friend of yours, but I, I think we cannot lose sight of what it is that Republicans traded their integrity for. I think it's important to remember that Paul Ryan may talk about poverty, but he actually pushes to eviscerate Medicaid, which is keeping, which is 40% of babies born in this country are born with the help of Medicaid to pay that bill. He actually talks about destroying the food stamp program, which is the way some people are able to eat. He's with Mick Mulvaney on getting rid of Meals on Wheels because he doesn't think that that's a, a good use of a taxpayer's money. This, this health care repeal, this attempt to appeal Obamacare, is a blatant attempt to say tax cuts for the affluent and for the rich are more important than the lives of, of human beings. And so the, what, what Republicans were willing to trade them, their integrity for, to me, is not more moral than what Donald Trump is proposing. Donald Trump is a Bulgarian. But it's Paul Ryan who's trying to take away people's health care. Well, Donald Trump is just, just a salesman. Let me just say, I, I, um, pa Paul Ryan has done more than many Republican congressmen in terms of trying to uh, explore poverty and poverty solutions from a Republican philosophical principle, which may be totally inadequate from your perspective. But it's something that he at least has, has cared it's about and talked about. Push people about. off the back of but, the truck and hope they can well, catch, but get then, up and run But then and the question them. is, what do you do when you're Speaker of the House and the bills you pass? Uh, I just want to... When in the, you're in the, Speaker of the House and have a Republican conference that you can barely control. Right, which is know. why no one wanted you, the job. <laughs> Speaking of people wanting the job, just in the little bit of time we have left, I want to, I want to put the focus back on Democrats, because you'd think a president less than six months in, 36% approval rating, Democrats would be looking pretty good. We talked about the problems in Congress. It's, it's the rigged system or districting. But the reality is the Democratic bench for 2020 sucks. <laughs> it's, it's bad. And, and that's because they've lost state houses and governorships all throughout the Obama era. So when you look at 2020, who, who do you have your eye on? And, and, and give, give, me, give me a broad enough list so they're not committing <laughs> anybody, but it's also interesting. Oh, God, this is depressing. Democrats lost the art of developing um, politicians the old-fashioned way, the way that Scott Walker was developed from a county executive to governor. So because the bench is so poor, they haven't developed a rank of, of strong state-based you know, based candidates, they're looking at a whole team of senators to run. Mm -hmm. um, and they haven't, you know, Barack Obama was developed as a party star four years before he ran for president. Who is out there now that's making a comprehensive case? I mean, I don't you see tell a lot. I mean, I think Kamala Harris is obviously very impressive. I don't know if she's going to want to run. Um, Elizabeth Warren impresses me, but you get a, the sexism of people saying, you know, she seems angry. So I feel like the sexism, you know, card is unfortunately going to be played against her if she were to try to run. Um, it kind of depresses me that 
you know, the people who are, seem to be most actively talk about running are, are you know, Joe Biden maybe again. Um, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm worried that the Democrats aren't developing that future star. Maybe we haven't seen them yet. As, be a, as a Republican, when I look at when I look at, at this slate of potential, first of all, I'm like still praying to God, baby Jesus, that Oprah or somebody like that runs. You know, Mark Zuckerberg. I don't care, Mark Cuban. You know, if we need another billionaire, you know, uh, yeah. the celebrity runs. Yeah. They have to be a celebrity. Godzilla and King Kong. Let's go at it. Yeah. But um, out of the entire slate. You know, that, that, that's been mentioned, it's about 20 people, which is also scary because that happened to Republicans yep. in 2016, and it opened up the way because there were 15 other Republicans eating each other's that's lunch. Right. It opened up the way for Donald Trump to have a shot. So, uh, but out of all of them, and, and uh, you know, look, I, I know he's practically fossilized, but the only one that I could consider voting for as a Republican of all of those is Joe Biden. It's so, okay, so I know he's old, but guys, Donald Trump ain't no spring chicken. <laughs> and and it, it, if you put, you know, if you have like Joe Biden and Donald Trump doing the presidential test, who, who are you going to bet on? <laughs> Someone just yelled Maxine Waters. All right, on that note, uh, thank you all. Thank you guys for a great conversation. Thank you all.